Good morning, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, How to Regulate AI Lessons from the Financial Sector. I'm Theos Evgenio, Professor at INSEAD, and it's a pleasure to have with me three wonderful panelists that I will introduce in a couple of minutes. This is a webinar in the series of uh, Tech Talks by Digital at INSEAD, sponsored by Accenture, which are focusing on the impact of digital technologies on management, business, and society. For more information, please visit the Digital at INSEAD website. Let me start by setting up a bit the stage before getting on board uh, the three panelists. It's been more than 25 years since the beginning of the internet, the commercial internet at least, as we know it, the mid 90s, mid late 90s. And it took us almost as long, quarter of a century, to start thinking about the potential risks the online platforms and the internet may have also created in addition to the incredible value. AI seems to be understanding this faster, meaning in about 10 years, if we say about 2010, 12 was the beginning of the modern big, bo big boom on commercial AI. Of course, AI has been longer around. It's been about 10 years that we, st we have big innovations in AI, and now we are thinking about the potential risk this can create. Different countries and regions are thinking about how to manage these risks in different ways. China, for example, seems to be quite ahead in terms of thinking about regulating generative AI, the latest wave of AI. Europe started a bit earlier than anybody else with the famous EU AI Act that probably will be become uh, getting practice in, um, in, uh, a, in two years from now or so. And finally, the US, where probably most of the innovation arguably has been happening in this space, is following its own path, where you have the big tech executives. We'll go to the next slide. The big tech executives, like Sam Altman from OpenAI, arguing and asking to be regulated. But eventually, about a month and a half ago, seven executives from seven AI firms walked out of the White House with an agreement with Biden and Harris on self-regulating. There are different approaches. There are different ways to manage risk. There are different risks. There are risks that the EU AI Act is discussing about and trying to manage, for example, about around the potential risks for critical infrastructure attacks, potential risks to democracy and elections, potential risks to education, uh, negative impacts of AI, HR, any, any common using AI for HR, for example, and employment in general, and managing the workforce, uh, law, applications of law of AI in law, legal, legal applications. There, they, there can be multiple risks behind. Of course, one of the risks we all think about very often is the risk of illegal content online generated by AI in large volumes, especially with today's technologies, which may even affect in ways that we may not be ready to react to, the upcoming elections. Next year, about three, four billion people are voting. So everybody's waiting to see what happens then. Within all this context, if we go to the next slide, regulators are talking about all sorts of different concepts and goals around social well-being or social order. These are actual keywords from the China, US, Europe official documents and, and discussions. You can probably, I invite you to uh, do a, a, a test in your head and see whether you can identify a couple of words here that you think come from any of the three regions. So you, you have regulators actually talk about, in their official documents, about trust, influence elections, model red teaming, fragmentation, socialist core values, security assessment, harmonization, safety, deliberately manipulative, security testing, influence decisions, and deceptive techniques. We are here today to discuss about how we can learn without reinventing the wheel. And if there is an area to learn from is a financial sector, which has a number of commonalities. For example, based on a lot of different quant, mathematical, sometimes opaque models. Model risk management, the concept in the financial sector, is not too far necessarily from AI model risk management. Anti-money laundering incidence management is not necessarily too far from 
online trust and safety or AI incidents management. Potentially systemic risks in the financial sector that we all experienced with the, with the global financial crisis 15 years ago is not very different from potential systemic risk at the political level or health level or other level globally. You will go to the next slide. We'll discuss today about all those issues, similarities and differences between the financial sector and AI and tech, self-regulation, risk governance frameworks for companies, corporate governance, regulatory harmonization, is it possible across regions, supervision and enforcement, of course, systemic risk and how to manage it globally, international institutions that we may need or may not need, and what are the challenges, and potential difference between US, China, and Europe. With this, next slide, please. Before, oh, maybe it's a poll, right, right? Before we start with the panelists, let's do our usual poll. Please spend a couple of seconds reading this and voting. Who do you believe is best positioned to effectively, ah, to effectively regulate digital technologies such as AI in terms of balancing safety and innovation in the next five to 10 years? China, Europe, US. Of course, the audience we know is not equally distributed across the regions also time differences, but let's see what the audience says. Europe, wow, interesting. I must say I'm kind of surprised, uh, but let's see, maybe you're right. Let's discuss all this with three really amazing panelists. We have with us today a member of the supervisory board of the European Central Bank and with long experience in the financial sector, Elizabeth McCall. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. You may turn on the camera. Also, Francois Candelon, Senior Partner and Global Director of BCG's Henderson Institute. Thank you, Francois, for joining. And my dear colleague, Ludo van der Heyden, who is a Chair Professor Emeritus of Corporate Governance at INSEAD. Thank you, Ludo, for joining us. It's a pleasure being here. Let's dive into this. Self-regulation. Let's start from that. Of course, companies have to manage risk, not because the regulators say, but because it makes business sense sometimes. So, Francois, let me start with you before we dive in the regulations. You've been in the forefront of AI innovation, but also AI risk management and, in, in, uh, and governance in, in companies. What happens out there across different industries in terms of thinking about AI risks and managing them? So, first of all, thank you very much to be to be here with, uh, with you, Theos. You the best, Ludo. Uh, thanks for inviting us. So I, I think that what, uh, uh, the, the, the first point I would like to make is that when we think about AI risk, very often we think about the big tech companies. But I would like to say that, in my opinion, we should look at the risk that is happening in the 99.99% of other companies, uh, because they are not always extremely clear about what they do with AI. And therefore, they are facing big risks. Uh, so they are facing the fact that there is a growing uh, expectation of accountability. Uh, I was interviewed uh, uh, a couple of months ago uh, by uh, a US commissioner who was very clear on the fact that uh, when they were making an investigation, um, in the case of bias and discrimination, uh, the answer like, uh, OK, sorry, but I don't understand the algo and what the answer is, so I'm not responsible, is something that is not acceptable for them. And therefore, we should expect many fines, but not just for the big tech companies, we'll have many fines for the uh, for the traditional uh, companies as well. So I, I think that's a, a first point that is important. I think that one of the risks as well, especially for these companies, is that they don't know how to use uh, you or to structure the human and AI collaboration. And we all know the, the, the big failure of um, IBM Watson in, in healthcare when they try to uh, to develop, to make uh, in healthcare, when they said, okay, let's make sure that we, with Watson, we will define and decide which treatment is best for, for cancer. And um, it was a big failure. However, when they were not deciding, but they were proposing alternative treatments to oncologists, it was a big success. So the ability today to have human AI collaboration is important. And with Gen AI uh, that we don't really know at the moment, it will be even, even more important. 
And the last but not least is about the question about continuous learning. Um, we all know that uh, it's one of the big AI benefits, but at the same time, in some cases, uh, this is not something that you. Uh, for instance, uh, we have your uh, um, we uh, we have the uh, the FDA that requires a lot of algorithms to make sure they fully understand uh, what they do. So so I think that we see many challenges. Um, for these traditional companies, so there are ways to solve them. We have AI um, that is uh, challenging and testing AI. We, had re we have red teaming. There are some uh, governance and the three lines of defense that we will discuss a little bit later, I guess. Um, and for me, um, you were talking about uh, self-regulation uh, for the big tech companies. Uh, I must admit that I don't have that many examples where self-regulation is a success. The only one I found, but there are maybe may others, is the uh, Japanese gaming industry that was really uh, attacked in, at the end of the 90s for uh, violence in the games and uh, explicit sexual content. And they were creating a specific and independent organization called uh, the CERO, the Computer Entertainment rating organization and that was a success but except this one i haven't seen that many so i i think it let's hope that the seven uh big tech that uh had this uh meeting with uh president biden and vice president harris uh will uh, make me, make me uh, wrong yeah hope is not a strategy of course and i really i really i really love the point that this um this discussion will have affects the 99.999 percent of the companies which are not big tech because they use ai in different ways increasingly more so that's important to to keep in keep in mind i was hoping you would say that we can outsource the risk management of ai to ai and we go home but it sounds like it's humans and machines and in fact some humans may to be may even, even, if, it, even if ai can challenge ai Yes, that's true. We but uh, hopefully the humans are at, at, the, are at the driver's seat. Some humans want to be too much at the driver's seat, Elizabeth. And I'm going back to the self-regulation um, approach of the US. It must be something tried in the financial sector. Has it worked? How well has it worked? What are the limitations? What are the potential benefits? And what would we say to those seven executives and everybody else about self-regulation for risks? Thank you. Thank you, Theo. First of all, um, thank you so much for inviting me to this very interesting panel and this very important perspective that you're bringing um, to the overall panel. What can we learn from the financial sector for the regulation of AI? Um, you talked a little bit about the white paper in the beginning, and the, you know we all can see that um, picture in our minds of the seven executives exiting the White House and coming out with a plan in a white paper. I've reviewed that document. Um, and they've made um, very important voluntary commitments in the white paper um, to self-regulate. But they also say, I think very importantly, that it's only a first step in developing and enforcing binding obligations. And that um, they also stated that the US government is, is planning to prepare an executive order and pursuing bipartisan legislation for responsible AI innovation. And you see the CEOs themselves of the different companies coming out and saying, uh, you know, look, uh, we really wanna make sure that we allow this technology to continue to develop because of the promise that it brings. You know, we could um, find answers for climate change. Um, we could cure cancer. We could um, help with poverty and food shortages in parts of the world by harnessing what AI can deliver. And these are, are certainly worthy uh, worthy technological advancements that we want to, to, uh, to grasp and to, to promote. But at the same time, they are expressing grave concerns about the risks that AI AI has. Um, I was in a Federal Reserve meeting uh, recently, and uh, one of the colleagues and experts there said something very chilling. He said, um, you know, it is the case that within this year, what you see, what you read, and what you hear will be called into question because of the deep fake uh, aspects of AI. You will not yet know whether you're dealing with human intervention or with AI intervention. So 
Um, I have to say that I very much agree with uh, the CEO of Google, Sundra Pichai, who said AI is too important not to regulate and too important not to regulate well. And this is the avenue that, you know, you've mentioned it, that the EU is pursuing by developing a regulatory framework with the AI Act, which is currently in the trilogues in Brussels. Um, so you asked me about self-regulation. Um, yes, it is 100% true that um, the United States has a long history of implementing self-regulatory organizations and putting them into play. And I think it's the case even today that uh, the SEC has oversight and enforcement responsibility over, I think, over 50 um, SROs, self-regulatory self organizations. Um, it, you know, what, what's behind that? The, the, and so clearly the financial sector is no exception to the implementation of self-regulation. And if you look back into history, um, the New York Stock Exchange was largely governed by some form of self-regulation alone throughout the 19th and the early 20th century. And then after the crash in 1929, that changed somewhat, not completely, but with some enforcement responsibility and other things being put in place with the SEC having some oversight over the national securities exchanges. Uh, but we, you know, history is a is a stark reminder about the vagaries of self-regulation and not least of which is the global financial crisis of 2008. And this raised um, very deep concerns about uh, why self-regulation has limitations and is challenged in the financial sector. So proponents of self-regulation talk about efficiencies, monetary experience that um, are derived from a system of self-regulation. And then opponents, of course, talk a lot and correctly so about the inherent conflicts of interest when the business must regulate the very members that fund it. So there's really three areas that I might um, just highlight, which I think um, we need to think about when we think about AI self-regulation. There's, there's first the conflict of interest question. Um, this is clearly the most important reason to be uh, you know, concerned about having regulatory oversight. And the long list of financial crises is sufficient testimony to the risk that um, you know, institutions may prioritize short-term profits and growth over the public interest if there is not a market um, instrument and structure that's in place. And that's especially worrying where individual failures in the banking sector, for example, can create systemic risk. And we can think about AI in this way as well. Enforcement, self-regulatory bodies don't usually have the authority, the funding, or the follow-through on the enforcement side. And then the third is, is fragmentation. Within, uh, without a, a centralized regulatory body, you will have inconsistent standards and enforcement across different entities and jurisdictions. And you know, my learning from a long career in, in financial services and in, in, uh, in supervision is really that where you see a systemic failure is where there is a gap in oversight. So I think it's very relevant um, in the debate about how to regulate AI to talk about public regulation. I'm not only in favor because I work for a public institution. Um, I really think it's an important discussion about how to ensure safe and secure and trustworthy AI, especially when the experts themselves are raising uh, grave concerns and calling for um, uh, oversight to be to be put in place. So I strongly welcome that the tech companies are engaged in the in the public debate. We need their expertise for sure as we design um, a more secure oversight system. Thank you. Elizabeth, and you also have a long private sector experience, so, so we hear a very balanced view. I'm sure. Um, I, I'm reading recently a book. Uh, I'm reading recently a book about the impact of index funds and private equity on you know the the, the political system actually eventually. And uh, one of the points there is the actual positive impact, according to this, um, this are a book by a Harvard Law School professor, uh, the positive impact of the SEC that you mentioned was basically started after the crisis and the financial crisis of the 20s, right? So, so it's interesting to see the positive implications of releasing energy and innovation. However, I'll go back and Ludo, I'm coming to you. I'll, I'll go back to your point you made, you made about why self-regulation potential because and it's more efficient. It, it can be things maybe more efficient, more innovation. So Ludo, We've been working together also on what we call tech governance, also for startups, not just for, for big tech or non-tech. And one of the things that we, we've been uh, discussing about is, uh, is about how tech entrepreneurs, tech executives, but also anybody touching technology, says hands off 
everything from regulation slows us down. We want to move fast, innovate. All this governance stuff is kind of just slowing us down. Why would one spend time on governance, starting from corporate governance, which is, as we go in a few minutes, one of the first lines of defense, second in this case. Um, why would one spend time on corporate governance and slow down growth, especially for technology? And what makes corporate governance and governance more broadly better or worse? And these are perfect governments. You are muted. You are muted. Thank you. The first thing I like to say is that there's a lot of fake news about governance. You know, so whenever you have an entrepreneur talking about governance being a failure, you always um, bring up a negative example of governance. So, so uh, we are there for good governance. So I, I'm the first one to say is. The last thing I want is bad governance. So I actually prefer in a certain way, no governance than bad governance. So, so but entrepreneurs like to, as, as the French say, entreprendre. So, so they like to sort of fill in the boxes or move outside the boxes. So there's something inimicable neg negative about governance. And what I've discovered in talking with some of the very successful entrepreneurs is in fact, they are the governors, but they don't like the word. So, so all they do, they don't execute anything anymore. <laughs> they just decide about, you know, investment allocations. They actually do governance, but they hate the word. So there is this allergy against the word governance. And, and a part of it is, is you know, part of the, the tradition in the U.S. With, with the Republicans that we don't want government because government is bad, you know, and now try without government, you know, and we see what happens when government is really bad. So, so basically... Uh, what my big statement uh, is to say um, every alcoholic, you know, will talk about self-regulate. The first thing he will say is, I'm not drinking, you know. And secondly, when I drink, I will not take the car if I'm drunk. This is self-regulation. I mean, this is crazy. So, so on the most basic principles, we do believe in, in governance because, you know, it's terrible. And we see this increasingly now with drugs. Um, is that is that sort of these people are very dangerous. If we think about a terrible example is the Sacklers, the opioid crisis in the US is a failure of governance. It's also a failure of crooks, but, you know, not being caught. But, but basically, governance is about responsibility, I think. And in any person who basically says, trust me, you know, doesn't understand the principle of governance, which is we're all biased, uh, we're all delusional, uh, you know, we're we're afraid, and I think we need to be governed. So the the real question is good governance, and and if I go back to your question about entrepreneurship, Deficiency. it's the successful people who talk about we don't need governance. But actually, if you are successful and you're value creating, good governance allows you to continue creating. So the idea that the boards are limiting you, I've been part of boards that actually have encouraged the CEO to take risk because the shareholders, you know, were with it. So, so governance for me is, is very poorly understood. It's always seen negative. It's, it's their people are ideologically um, tied to it. Uh, the world is suffering from a lack of global governance. The world is not governed. This is why we're all getting fried. So the idea that you could even argue against the need for governance is is I think for me uh, quite quite foolish. And then going back to self-regulation, yes, in every company that I've worked with on regulation, the first principle was delegation, which is the first line of defense is where you stop things. So it's not at the board that you stop things. You basically make people responsible and you share this sense of responsibility with all people. Did we lose Lodo? We lost Lodo, right? Okay. Well, uh, we had a lot from uh, a lot of uh, good points here. Let me st step in while Ludo is reconnecting. Uh, he's actually traveling, um, so if the internet is a bit um, not too stable there. Elizabeth, let's dive in a little bit into the house. And uh, both Francois and Ludo mentioned about lines of defense, self governance, regulations. I mean, let's put some order here. So there is, uh, of course, a concept of three lines of defense that um, it's pretty uh, well accepted in the financial sector. First of all, can you give us a, 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 a brief summary of what is the idea of three lines of defense? What are those three lines of defense? How do they work? And what does everybody do in these three lines of defense? 
Thank you. Um, and I think this is very much in keeping with your panel discussion about what can we learn from financial services as we think about um, how there should be appropriate oversight of AI. And three lines of defense is certainly a great uh, a great place to, to start. It's relatively new development in financial services. If we can say that, um, you know, something developed over the last 20, 25 years is rather new. And it was developed in recognition of the fact that um, Having a, an internal audit function, a control function alone, would not be enough to provide effective challenge for the risk taking and risk making exercises that are taking place in the bank, but that we need to have also a risk management mitigation uh, model that's also put in place that provides challenge to the risk taking activities. So the idea is rather simple. Um, you, you know, it's really that um, your first line of defense would be your revenue generating business units. This would be the areas of the institution that are um, taking risk, your trading activities, your credit delivery mechanisms, your deposit taking activities, uh, your wealth management oversight, et cetera. These are the areas of the bank that are, are, are generating profits for the institution. Um, the second line is really the new development here, and that is the creation of a function within the institution that has the responsibility for identifying, monitoring, and managing and reporting the, the risks and providing challenge to the first line of defense in the way that it itself is managing risks. The idea is not that risk management takes over the activities of managing risk that belong to the first line of defense. There can't be an abrogation of this responsibility from the first line, but rather that the second line um, puts in place a, an important function that has a reporting line uh, to the board of directors so that its independence within the institution is preserved. And risk management would also have um, compliance functions and compliance responsibilities so that there would be um, appropriate oversight, not just from a legal point of view, which often has advocacy responsibilities associated with it, but um, compliance responsibilities for providing effective challenge, for assessing risk, and for making sure that the institution complies with the full a panoply of regulations that it is subject to. Um, the third line of defense, uh, and very important, is that internal audit function, which in most institutions already has a direct line to the audit committee at the board level. Um, so it, it's, it's an important development. Um, it came about because of uh, market busts, the dot-com crisis comes to mind, for example. Certainly, um, we were challenged to think about the three lines of defense model in the subprime crisis, the great financial crisis, what was the failure? It might be interesting um, to know that, um, you know, we found, in fact, in 2008, that uh, most institutions had an independent risk management function, um, and it even had appropriate reporting lines to the boards of directors. But it was um, an ivory tower structure, and it was so independent, so far from the, fin the CFO office, that it was not in tune with market correlation, market risk, and its models were out of whack with what was happening with the risk that was developing in the subprime crisis. So one of the learnings there is that we want to make sure that we're not creating an independent structure that is so independent that it misses the market on uh, where the risk is. Um, I, I'm a, an enormous fan of the three lines of defense structure. I think we continue to hone its capabilities. Um, I think it, it it works extremely well. It, it doesn't work well if it's not invested in. Um, and this is a key thing that, you know, appropriate resources, properly skilled resources, um, this is not a profit-making part of the institution. So sometimes it might be under-resourced, um, and that's a mistake because it can actually preserve the profit-making capability of an institution if it's done appropriately. Very good point. In line with what Ludo was saying, I believe, unless you want, I don't know if you want to add something, Ludo, on this last point of Elizabeth, on the value. I think it, yes, it's, it's also value creating in terms of, of avoiding value destruction is value creation compared to the counterfactual, which is you keep going in the wrong direction. I mean, that was actually the financial crisis, which is, you know, uh, value creation is not just new growth. It's also avoiding value destruction. So I think that part should be emphasized as well. 
And then I, I think this is probably the area in which uh, AI can benefit for the practice now um, is, is that uh, in banks and in financial institutions, the three lines of defense is working. I think Elizabeth has said this, it's not perfect, but it's working, it's accepted, and it's a practice. And I think the problem in the beginning, people didn't react that way. So it's very important as well to, to sort of learn the practice, to become efficient, but the first thing in, in uh, governance is, is effectiveness, which is we need to stop bad things from happening and we need to stop them early. That's if, you know, and, and I think that's what, that's what um, the three lines of defense is. I think AI has a long way to go to integrate that practice, but at the same time can start from what probably is four centuries of experience in the finance world about control and governance. You know, we can go back. I'm now visiting the the Dales here in Yorkshire. Uh, you know, you you occasionally still hear about the South Sea bubble. You know, that was a a big failure of of regulation where everybody was involved, including the king, and and that should not have happened. Um, and and so basically, um, yes, three lines of defense. I will just finish with three lines of defense, which is a different way, which is the corporation should self regulate. Then um, the the regulatory authorities should regulate, and the owners should regulate as well. So for me, the owners are the third line of defense, and that's where private equity uh, presents a very good example of good governance. Private equity, most uh, great example of private equity uh, of good governance, come from private equity or family-owned companies. And you don't get to be 300 years old if you don't have a good governance system uh, in place. Thank you, Ludo. Thank you. Thank you, Ludo. It's important to keep in mind the timelines here. Uh, AI is still really, really young, and so are the tech people. It's very interesting for me always to sense some kind of you know arrogance, and we know it all from the tech people, myself being a tech person, and trying to remind everybody, including myself, that we are still really, really young in the context of you know centuries of lessons from other sectors and fields. Now, on the value creation point, I'm going back, back, back to that, on the value creation point, part of the value creation is, of course, lack of value destruction, but also about selling your products and having adoption from the market and having acceptance from the market, products and services, right? Which the products and services may have AI embedded. You don't have to be a big tech, as you said. You can be you know, an automotive company or a healthcare company or whatever, and still you know, uh, embed AI in your products and services. And for those to get accepted, you need to ensure they have what um, the two of us often discuss about in the concept you, you very much um, talk about, which is a um, social license. Maybe you tell us a bit about, first of all, the concept of social license, and then how does this fit in this picture? Because eventually the consumer buys and the society accepts. I, I think that's a very important point, but maybe before I come back to that, I would like just to uh, come to these three lines of uh, defense and in the fact that in many corporations, they are not implemented why they will use AI. So they can learn from the financial institutions as well, but they are not always extremely strong there. But what we see that in the company that were able to develop responsible AI models and so on, instead of being a, a, a problem or a roadblock to innovation, it actually helps. And the more you are structured, the better you are on this and I will come down and expand to the, the, the social license, but even on what we call responsible AI, on fairness, transparency, and so on, it actually helps, and it is value creator. So I, I think that today, uh, with AI, and especially with generative AI, it's absolutely critical for corporations to enter into this mindset if they want to sell their product. But as you said, their product is not just about being responsible, fairness, uh, transparency. I, I think that there are two things that we are we need to add if we want to have the social right to use AI opposite to the legal right. Um, and to this responsible AI, I add, and I, I wrote a piece in, uh, let's say, MIT SMR on that, we need to add two other things. The one which is about uh, the risk return potential, and this can be very different by region. I was working in, uh, in China, I've been working for many years in, uh, in China, um, and uh, I was working in uh, Western China on, in hospitals, and there they really lack 
GPs. And therefore, having a great diagnostic for their lives is absolutely critical. And this is why they are really willing to provide their own data. And the question of privacy, or you could say China, but it's less about China than about the fact that, okay, it's more the, 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 the Maslow pyramid and the need to really say, okay, I want to, to be safe and safe. And at the same time, in Europe, we have a very different perspective. So I think that we will see that this rich benefit have to be taken by region depending on the needs of your customers. This is the first thing. And the second thing is about a kind uh, of a social contract, which is about the, the, the accountability and trust that we have for the company that is using it. And, and I believe that this is where, as we said, this notion of governance of three lines of defense uh, uh, can become even more important. Uh, if you take, for instance, uh, autonomous cars, of course, there are some technology issues. There, are the, there is the fact as well that basically we cannot accept that one, um, let's say the machine should be perfect. Um, we can see for instance in San Francisco that you have less, uh, import, less uh, accidents. Uh, much less accident than what you uh, used to have without it. However, as soon as there is one, you stop everything. So, but this is the way we think about machines, and this is on our the way the, in our imagination what are we see machines. However, I think that we are facing a problem of accountability and trust. What would happen if it were hacked? Cybersecurity. Do we trust? Um, do we trust the uh, the uh, the companies that are doing it? Uh, it's very difficult. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Francois. I mean, uh, the, the concept of algorithmic aversion and therefore lack of acceptance and having higher, requiring higher standards from technology and AI is very interesting. I mean, I like to call it machine racism from humans. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of... Ludo, 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 maybe you might have a comment on that? Or... Yeah. Yes, uh, I think uh, first, um, I think in terms of, of the, the the aversion to regulation or, or regulation being built on the past, I think this is the the what is commonly also misunderstood, which is the common of COVID was that it was new and therefore everything had to be started again and, and the previous regulation didn't apply, etc. But in fact, in most in most cases, you have patterns that are common. So the the emergence of the of the, the destruction, the emergence of the, the value destruction is idiosyncratic, but the patterns are, are repetitive. And I think regulation goes for patterns. That's, I think, what, what I would say. Um, and, and I think the people who went for patterns, for example, in COVID, were the people in, in uh, Taiwan, they were observing, they were looking at patterns. And of course, uh, pulmonary uh, viruses had existed. And COVID was not completely new. So I think that's my comment on, on the question and also trying to answer uh, Francois is that uh, regulation builds memory and, and the world changes and, and the system needs to be adjusted. And somebody needs to be in charge of adjusting the system. And I think you cannot let uh, a firm be responsible for the adjustment. If you knew that the stock market was, uh, was failing, uh, then you would take advantage of that as an investor. You wouldn't. You wouldn't start changing the market. You would just invest like crazy, and and that's why I think you need to have somebody who takes care of what is called the public interest, and not assuming that the actors are not socially responsible. It's just that that it's it's again a layer of defense and information is a public good, and I think we still do not understand the impact of AI on the current dysfunctioning of democracies, for example. It's not that this is going to happen. I think it's happening in front of our eyes and we need to react to it uh, quite uh, quickly. But I'm not sure I fully responded to Francois's One sort of point pitch. You, Ludo, you also covered part of a question that we see from the audience, which is about um, regulations, especially another, an experience we have from the financial sector is that regulations are often trying to catch up with the next crisis. And uh, your point about the memory, it creates and the, and the continuous learning partly answers that question. I don't know if Elizabeth, you have something to add on how can regulations actually you know, be before the next crisis, this time potentially because of technology. Is that something we can do to improve this, to minimize um, this? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I love the the question about, you know, how do we become more forward looking? And Ludo, uh, your comment about creating memory. Um, I think what it is, I would maybe just elaborate on that. We need to create muscle memory. I mean, you know, that we have a, a phrase in the US and forgive me for using it, but it is there ain't no education in the second kick of the mule. And so what does that mean? It means we need to learn from the past. And, you know, it's it's always, uh, you know, quite astonishing to me that we continue to need to learn the lesson that uh, the financial markets are interconnected and that uh, there is contagion risk that occurs across the globe because of the development of the global marketplaces. Shocks in one country quickly spread and they don't stop at national borders. So it's it's very clear, and it's been clear, especially since the great financial crisis, that far greater cooperation um, and a more global approach to regulation and supervision needed to be put in place. And so we created, of course, the Financial Stability Board under the G20, and you've seen very intensive work of the Basel Committee in financial services since 2008. And this is a testimony to the insight that there ain't no education in the second kick of a mule, and we need to develop muscle memory so that we can be more forward-looking about where risk is starting to emerge um, and become something that can threaten financial stability. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, and you will have heard me say this in many fora, um, failures, systemic failures occur where there is a gap in oversight. In the past year, we've seen, um, we've we've borne witness to um, the failure of, of Signature Bank in the United States. We had the failure of FTX. We had, um, of course, the failure of Credit Suisse. Um, we, we see that there is, um, you know, when I focus in on the tech aspects of this, there were connection points in some of those places to the development of technology and to some of the interrelated risks that um, the financial services sector has to that, especially in the case of Signature Bank, and especially, of course, in the case of FTX. These are, you know, pointing to some gaps in the oversight. Um, and I think, you know, what we really need to be looking at internationally is, uh, you know, a set of principles that imagines that we put far greater development uh, toward a framework, a regulatory framework and oversight of AI, recognizing that it can affect um, financial services and that there is an interconnectedness there. So we need to have principles about ensuring trustworthiness of AI. We need to um, implement principles about uh, risk management of AI, testing of the systems, monitoring of the systems, no black box. We need to make sure that fairness and ethics are playing an important role. Discrimination, is, is that being monitored? Is that being taken into account? Or, you know, if not, would we end up having uh, lending that would create more risk in the overall system? Um, I think, you know, there's concern expressed by the tech executives about um, security of the systems and how these AI systems could be subject to cyber risk, uh, to hacks, or even, you know, maybe most worryingly, that they could be released um, as a, a breach of security before they've been completely tested. Um, these are, you know, we need a, a collaboration and a cooperation on that on the international front so that there isn't a, a release of a system that can do harm to our society or do harm to our economy. So, um, you know, these are, are, are questions of our age that the head of Microsoft said, um, this is the challenge of the 21st century AI, and we need to use the muscle memory that we've developed in financial services from crises that you know have had the effect of bringing economies to their knees. We need to build on what we've learned there and put in place an appropriate international framework in my view, because if only one part of the market is overseeing, these aspects, we won't be able to cover the interconnectedness issues that I think raise gaps. Thank you, Elizabeth. And this is a topic that has is uh, is gaining steam from um, what we see, the uh, the topic of uh, interconnect global interconnectedness and potential gaps with powerful AI systems being released potentially before we fully understand how they behave, and being used potentially by anybody globally for whatever reasons. I mean, one one way to um, sometimes people sometimes people compare 
I mean, it's a bit exaggeration, but um, let me exaggerate uh, along those lines. Compare AI risk to you know nuclear risks, let's say, right? So again, exaggeration potentially. However, one major difference is that nuclear is pretty, pretty, pretty well constrained. Access is constrained. You know, nuclear proliferation treaty, and you no, know, not we can't have nuclear uh, weapons in our hands, but we can definitely have AI weapons in our hands. All of us can. And that's a major difference, which may require even more careful filling of the gaps and building of muscles, including global institutions, as you call, as you mentioned. I'm wondering whether we can build global institutions to manage the risks of AI being used across the globe before being tested, before being understood. Is there any way to converge? I mean, we see different approaches between Europe, China, and the US. We see Europe talking about, we want AI with European values. We want China saying we want AI, number, article number one of the proposed draft for the generative AI regulation in China has to be uh, uh, protecting the socialist values along those lines. How can we get convergence in something that actually is not only about money, it's also about values? Francois, you've been um, you've been in China for quite some time, as you as you as you. No, 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 and and, and it's a very good question, and I'm worried about it. I had a, I was part of a panel with uh, Gabriela Ramos from uh, the UNESCO, who's been uh, let's say writing uh, on the uh, ethics of AI, and I and I don't know, and honestly, uh, we were saying, oh, it's worth trying, but at the end, I fear that despite all what we said, this notion of global. Uh, it is just um, it's just wishful thinking. Uh, even if you look, for instance, at uh, let's say the fragmentation of the world, even of the uh, let's say the online content with social media in the in the EU with the DSA, we are really uh, a strict moderation of this uh, online content for platforms. Uh, if you go to the U US, the US Section 2630 of the Decency Act basically gives a, a large immunity of it. Um, and I think that at the moment, AI is seen more as a weapon by different uh, regions, plus you have, and this is maybe the way you, you could think about the self-regulation of the seven uh, large tech companies in the US as well. Okay, do what you can. Uh, so so I, I fear that we need to be maybe a bit less ambitious um, and not trying to, ex we, I, I would go for it. I don't I would love it. Uh, but I, I fear that it won't happen. Uh, however, we need, uh, I, we, we do probably disagree, but um, there is one more thing that worries me, and not even at the level of the interconnectedness, uh, global interconnectedness, but which is the, uh, the, 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 the vast, um, I would say, uh, knowledge asymmetry that we have on AI between the firms and the regulators, which is, I believe, much larger or broader than the one we have in, FI, in, uh, in finance, in, for financial institutions. So how do we make sure that we make companies go hand in hand with, um, with the regulators uh, to do it? So it's a little bit the way the Chinese are, are moving forward. Uh, but uh, not saying this is the model to follow, but, uh, but at least uh, I, this is on top of the interconnectedness. This is another thing, another issue that I see and uh, that I'm not sure how to solve it. Ludwig, we talked about, uh, and I'm going to look at the questions from the audience. Uh, we talked about uh, collaborative learning potentially between companies and, um, and uh, regulators and also across, across regions. Any comments on this and what does it mean in practice? How does it, how, what can we do? Well, in, in, my, in my practice, uh, whenever there's a failure, somebody knows. So basically the information is in the system. Uh, there are actors who know it. And that's the call for responsibility, which is, uh, will this information travel? And that's a question of interconnectedness. And it's also the ability to send the signal and then to receive the signal. So um, I would say a big part of, of three lines of defense is that the three lines must talk to each other and must have open access to each other. Um, this is a bit, a, bit a bit complicated, but I think Elizabeth will be the first one to, to uh, smile when I say this. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk to 
to uh, bankers, um, they sort of misunderstand what regulators can do for them. And they they sort of have this adversarial relationship. And I think that's very negative. Uh, I think this is now overcome. And, and I think uh, that, that openness um, needs to come. And this is where uh, my answer now jumping ahead is that uh, we need AI to, to, for governance, which is the, this is what I call Turing's law, you know, which is only a man with a machine can, can defeat the machine. So we do need progress on AI that is applied to detecting errors early in a way that people are are not worried about so that corporations are open for it and i think that for me is the research now that will actually depend on the values of the of the actors but we need to design systems that are self regulating in a good way but let's not forget you mentioned nuclear you know at some point it was a nuclear uh, attack planned by by uh, russians on on the west and it only was because one commander the final commander didn't trust the order that the the nuke didn't come out so it's not that we avoided nuclear we avoided nuclear war but thanks to actually humans being responsible so we need to work on 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 two questions global responsibility and i very much believe in global uh, regulators talking to each other because there is a view that, uh, and, and I think, as Elizabeth says, the muscle is in the regions. So there's no way the Europeans will allow the Americans or the, or the, um, the, the Chinese to regulate. The muscle must be region. But that doesn't mean that the brains and the hearts and the minds cannot talk. And I very much believe that the future should be first on, on catching this, uh, creating sort of a global institution where the world, somewhere in the world, this probably can only be a UN agency, um, but maybe can be another agency as well, which actually talks about the risks of AI. And you cannot regulate things that you're not aware of, and you can only become aware of things by talking. So my feeling is we have this dual system or this triple system. Corporations should become more responsible. Uh, regulatory agencies are needed. And then the, the regional, the progress in terms of the muscle will be regional, but, but, uh, but the overall governance of the spirit of AI or, or being aware of, of the dangers of AI must be done globally. And I think that's where now, in a certain way, I regret G20 is becoming more powerful because the UN is very inefficient and very ineffective. So, so, so basically that's, the that's, world and is and giving G20 more, more, more leeway. Uh, that's a, we're opening a, another gen, big topic over here. I'd like to go back to some questions uh, as we close from the audience. How does good look like? And maybe we start, Elizabeth, with you about AI, of course, let's take the financial sector. I don't know how you, how the financial sector regulators think about AI in the financial sector. So we're changing a little bit the topic here. And I'm sure there are discussions about how to regulate AI in the financial sector as it's, it's used in the financial sector, right? How, what does good look like? And how do we know that we make progress in terms of regulations working better than before? Uh, let me let me start just by validating Francois's comments that you know we we need to imagine um, you know probably some very big issues globally that need to be addressed, but we have to start. We have to walk before we run, and we have to start in our backyards with how we um, supervise. The fact is that AI is being used by financial services now. And, uh, you know, in order to make sure that um, we understand that, the, BC, the, BC, the Basel Committee has already published, um, you know, some of the discussions and some of the thinking that the international supervisors have about how to make sure that as institutions use AI, and, and that's the reality and that's appropriate, um, that the supervisors are equipped so that they can um, assess whether the appropriate governance functions are in place, whether the appropriate risk assessments are taking place, whether testing of the systems is in place. Um, these are the, you know, bread and butter of supervision is about that kind of risk management and that kind of oversight. So um, we are doing those things as, as we speak now, as institutions are looking to deploy AI in effective ways to lower their costs, to, to deliver more effective services to their customers, um, but you know, it's it's a it's it's a as you said, Theos, 
it's the young, uh, the beginning stages. Um, it's it's new technology, and um, the institutions are learning by doing. So are the supervisors. Secondly, we are putting AI tools and technology into the hands of the supervisors. The ECB has been um, at the forefront of doing development in this area in order to make sure that from a soup tech point of view, um, the supervisors are equipped to use AI to help them to consume, digest, understand the vast amounts of data that come across their desks so they can begin to detect emerging risks. That's the use of the machine to enhance the human understanding of where risk is taking place. And the fact is, these are symbiotic. As we use the tools in the house, um, we will be able to understand better what the risks are that the institutions are incurring as they deploy the tools. But last, I really um, do think that we should um, not have a vision for uh, what's needed at the global level. And you know, where the BCBS is talking about putting an AI office in place in order to provide oversight globally um, and foster cooperation. Um, I think this is terrific. The AI Act envisions that as well. I think uh, we need to recognize that there are institutions that are not transparent, that are growing in various jurisdictions with small components, but the larger picture is not well understood. And we have principles in financial services in, in that are re requiring for consolidated comprehensive supervision to be provided by a home country supervisor. If the institution doesn't have a jurisdiction, where is the consolidated comprehensive supervision coming from? And in the securities world, it's the same thing. It depends on a, an equivalency regime. So we're in territory that is new when we talk about um, technologies that do not know borders and institutions that do not have borders that are operating and providing risk into our system. So I would have, um, you know, encourage vision, visionary thinking about, you know, how that problem can be solved. Thank you, Elizabeth. So it seems that we need a number of more webinars to discuss these topics. We don't have time, unfortunately. So let, let's use the last one minute or two, maybe for um, uh, Ludo and uh, Francois to share your closing thoughts or maybe insights from today's webinar or before or messages in one minute each. Ludo? Uh, we need uh, good governance as opposed to bad governance. We need good tech as opposed to bad tech. We need good people as opposed to bad people. So I think for me, uh, that's sort of my, my key conclusion and, and or my key uh, word. And then secondly, I find it amazing that corporate CEOs in America, you know, sort of basically call for the stop of progress on tech, on AI. I mean, that for me is like is like uh, sort of shooting your, yourself in the foot. How can corporate uh, CEOs call for the end of, of, of progress in tech? Hopefully this is only happen. because they and need we'll to call for, for they need to admit that some regulation is needed. Eventually they got self-regulation. Francois, some closing remarks and the remaining minute. No, thanks a lot. But I, I think that I would like people to remember that while we can learn from finance, there are some specificities. There will be more unknown unknowns. And there is like LLMs, for instance, and their emerging capabilities. And the fact that there is a vast asymmetry between firms and regulators. And I think that this is one of the big things to get sold. And the second message that I would like people to keep in mind is the fact that we talk a lot about the big tech companies. And it is worth having that because otherwise we'll have a lot of uh, IP uh, that will be concentrated in a very limited number of companies, but this needs to address all the 99.99 or 999 99% of other companies, uh, because this is where a lot of risk might happen that would not be based on malefic mindsets, but just because people work, I, I don't compare it to nuclear, I compare it to nitroglycerin. With nitroglycerin, you can do great things, but if you don't know how to uh, manage the manage it, you can have some issues. And this is the responsibility of everybody, not only the big tech. That's a key message here. We have a lot to learn, a lot of unknown unknowns, which will keep us busy and excited going forward. Thank you very much for the wonderful discussion, Elizabeth, Francois, Ludo, and the audience.
please see on the Digital Initiative website for upcoming webinars. Thank you for being with us. Have a good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are.